Good morning. We've been told that we're on a fast pace, so this panel is going to have to talk very fast. But before we start, I'd like to talk a little bit about education as an integral part of both DIMAX and the research that's gone on at DIMAX. And it dates back to what I call the prenatal stage of DIMAX, when the proposal was being created. And I actually read that original proposal with Danny Gorenstein saying, you got to change this or you got to change that. And Fred was the primary author of that proposal. And of course, he and I go way back. So there is always this coming together to decide what the terms actually meant. But for the first 20 years, at any rate, Joe Rosenstein was education director for DIMAX. And I think it's only in the last two years he decided he would retire. And I've taken his place, even though he and I are the same age. <laughs> but Joe, with the help of Al DeBellis and others, got education going. I was at NSF during the 90s. And if he didn't get a proposal funded that he wanted to be funded, he showed up in my office at the crack of dawn and said, Mitch, you got to fund this for us. And that worked actually quite well. <laughs> he was doing professional development. He was working with parents. And that was the only time NSF really ever was concerned about parents and their role in education. He worked with the New York State Systemic Initiative. He worked with the uh, various committees that were designing uh, the Common Core standards, but even dating back to when the NCTM standards were being developed and had come out. So, Joe, I would like to thank you for basically setting the whole education movement at DIMAX. And I'm only continuing your good work. So, and he's still doing some odds and ends at the same time. So I had to, I had to start with that particular uh, tribute to Joe. But what our panel is going to address a number of different things. But one of them is what has been part of DIMAX and the education projects that DIMAX has done meant to you personally and professionally. So we'll start with each person answering that question and we'll come to a few other questions at the same time. I'll start with Christy Adams. Christy goes back to the Biomath project, but she's not a biologist. She was a physics teacher in Oklahoma City area and was perfectly content to teach physics until we co-opted her into being the part of a number of our projects, in particular the newest project, which is the computational thinking professional development online. She's now at Cotty College and runs their educational program. So, Christy? So I first uh, came on board with Midge, like she said, with Biomath Connection. And yeah, I didn't teach biology, I didn't teach math, I was the physics person. And at that first initial meeting, I was the only physics person. Uh, but what I found out very quickly and that I didn't even know about myself was that I could speak the languages of both biology and math. And so I really kind of started putting more of a, a physics twist into the biology and math lessons. Um, but professionally, what this journey has meant to me is really the network with professionals that I have been able to, to make. Um, as a high school teacher, we often feel isolated and away from what real professionals are doing in our fields. This gave me an opportunity to work with scientists and mathematicians and to take their work and put it into a lesson or multiple lessons or modules, like that's what we typically call them, or modules, into a way that high school students could feel like scientists and mathematicians. So it brought this level of authenticity to my classroom that I was not able to achieve prior to my work uh, with Midge and IMAX. Um, in addition, it's challenged me to be creative in my teaching and to think outside the box. Personally, uh, I have found a family 
this is this is a family. Um, we may not speak every day. We may not speak every week. It may be a couple of months. But man, I meet these people, and there are hugs and kisses, and it's just like, oh, so good to see you. What are you doing now? So that meant a lot to me. Um, individual conversations with Midge, typically, you know, 5 p.m. drink or something, really inspired me to do more with my career. I actually went ahead and achieved a terminal degree in instructional leadership and academic curriculum that really was inspired by Midge and my work with DIMAX. I, I figured out, hey, I can reach more students if I can teach teachers how to do this. And that's really where my work with computational thinking and our professional development right now is taking me. So it's been an amazing journey. I hope it continues, um, but I'll pass it on. Saul Garfunkel has been director of COMAP, the Consortium on Mathematics and its Applications, since its inception. And COMAP is slightly older than DIMAX. Even though we never quite celebrated the 30th, it's probably closer to 32, 33 years. But I will let him <laughs> talk to it. Our work with COMAP has been ongoing for many years, and in particular the biomath project, the uh, computational thinking, and the sustainable future modules are all produced by COMAP for us, thank goodness, because we're not publishers. <laughs> Sal. Well, Mitch, um, actually next year COMAP celebrates its 40th anniversary. Oh. Um, that, that's hard to imagine. Um, but um, as you mentioned, I mean, our work with DIMAX started in, in the uh, mid and late 80s um, because Joe um, was teaching, was the uh, professional development programs in discrete mathematics, um, I suppose the 80s and 90s, and in, in New Jersey in particular. Um, and he needed materials, and we had gotten this um, NSF grant um, the HIMAP grant, the High School Mathematics and Applications grant in 84. And so those were precisely the materials we were producing. We were producing these modules which were designed for teachers to help them teach modeling and applications, almost all of which were discrete um, because we have always felt from the beginning that um, it was important to introduce mathematical ideas that were not simply on the road to calculus and it wasn't necessary for kids to be able to add fractions or put them away somewhere. Um, and so uh, this was exactly the kinds of materials that Joe was looking for and materials we were producing. And Joe was a um, passionate and effective um, force for this kind of change. Um, I've got prepared remarks which I want to talk about relative to the future, but I think even with the work that we're doing with Midge and module development and other things, it hasn't been since the mid-80s that DIMAX took a political stand, that DIMAX stood up and said, no, well, Joe stood up. Actually, <laughs> Joe could lie down and he was standing up. Um, but Joe was saying that this is the kind of mathematics we should be teaching, not just in high school, we should be teaching K-12. These are the kinds of models kids should be seeing. Mathematics should be uh, a mile wide, and I don't care how deep it is. Students need to see all the applications, all the uses of mathematics. That kind of political statement, which came under a great deal of uh, criticism uh, during the math wars in early late 90s, early 2000s, is, is something that we need all the help we can get. And it's a position I would love to see DIMAX take in the future. We'll come back to that question of what you would <coughs> like to see us do in the future. You set the stage for that. But Jim, you've been around DIMAX a long time, too. <laughs> I uh, was by trade a computer programmer and through a convoluted means became a high school teacher and then a teacher of technology to other teachers. Uh, this was a soul-crushing experience in the late 90s and early 2000s. And 
in 2002, I was very close to just leaving the profession entirely, and my principal handed me a paper looking for people interested in a research project in discrete math at Rutgers, and I came and spent three weeks, which changed everything. Um, the people that I worked with, the people that I interacted with, completely made me see that there were people involved in education, math education, who wanted to change math education. Uh, the, that grant lasted two years. Uh, the second year, Fred asked us if anyone was interested in coming back to work on some ideas that he had for a biomath grant. And I was, hey, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and uh, I came back. And the following year, I begged him for any position, and he agreed, and he hasn't been able to get rid of me since then. Uh, and it has come full circle now to where we are again training teachers in computational thinking, and we're using all of the tools that we've learned over these last 20 years at DIMAX, or I've learned in these last 20 years at DIMAX, and the previous 10 years of what not to do. And I'm, again, the, the answer to the next question is coming up. But it's, it, this has been an amazing experience, and I'd like to thank you all for being here for me. Thanks, Jim. We also have done a number of things internationally, but in particular, the REU program, which has been around for years and years now, has had a interaction with the people in the Czech Republic, and in particular, Martin Lowell will say a little bit about his experience connecting the Czech Republic to uh, the U.S., particularly through DIMAX and the REU program. Uh, so, uh, I'm Martin Lebel, I'm professor in Charles University, Prague, Czech Republic. I came uh, to DIMAX for the first time in 93, I think, uh, there was a semester of discrete maths organized by Paul Seymour. I think uh, everybody, most of the people, we were working on something called the even cycle problem. And later, uh, I realized that it's uh, uh, something, uh, in fact, related to statistical physics and to enumeration, and that's what uh, I am doing uh, since. Uh, somehow, discrete maths, uh, uh, enumeration, uh, statistical physics and uh, complexity. Uh, there is, uh, I keep working with the people I met uh, uh, in DIMAX, in fact, uh, in, uh, in 93, in fact, uh, this year, I do, uh, I uh, have a paper with uh, Paul Seymour and, uh, and uh, Maria Chudnovsky on uh, something uh, uh, indirectly related to a, a problem suggested by uh, Verkvinur Dur, who is a mathematical physicist uh, on uh, triangulations of three ball. Uh, uh, my, uh, but, uh, so that's uh, how I met, uh, that, that's how I became a uh, member of this uh, community. Uh, there is uh, uh, as, as equally strong connection is uh, through uh, this incredible uh, REU program. It's uh, really uh, magic. It's incredible that uh, it works for such a long time. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, for, and I am extremely glad that uh, Prague is a part of it. It's one of the many uh, great things which uh, Jarek Neshetril did. Uh, he, uh, he, because he really, uh, uh, established this uh, connection and he's uh, running it. I'm just, uh, I have a very modest uh, uh, interruption uh, in this, uh, which happened uh, this uh, uh, basically last year and uh, perhaps will a uh, couple more years uh, because we got uh, a, a European funding uh, for uh, somehow uh, it's a bigger grant which includes uh, which in fact uh, includes uh, uh, DIMAX uh, from European side. It is uh, uh, it's, uh, Prague, uh, Technion, uh, Paris. Uh, I am uh, the main coordinator in, in uh, 
US is uh, Dimex, Princeton, uh, Los Alamos, and uh, Simon Fraser in, in Canada. Uh, this uh, and uh, uh, it uh, sponsors, uh, uh, it basically pays uh, academic visits. Uh, it's uh, part of great uh, European community program, uh, uh, research and innovation uh, stuff exchange. And part of it uh, is uh, that uh, we can uh, uh, pay our students uh, coming here. Uh, I think it's uh, the, the Czech student now more Czech students can come. Uh, that this year there were ten of them. Uh, is uh, uh, the, the, uh, as uh, the Lazarus uh, uh, is uh, Lazarus Gaios uh, is uh, is uh, taking care of the the program for many years. So 10 uh, students came for two, two months this, uh, from Prague this year. Uh, it's somehow the Prague, uh, uh, <laughs> Prague thing is uh, part of, uh, I think it's strongly embedded in the DIMAX. Uh, in fact, uh, Czech students are in the front photo of uh, your folder in front of you. So they are Czech, uh, Czech guys there. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And Lara Pudwell is at Valparaiso University as a faculty member, but she started out as one of the graduate students over the years who has helped with the REU program. And back when she did it, she was pretty much all by herself doing it. So she'll tell you a little bit about that influence and what she does today. Lara? Sure, thanks. So when I was hired as the graduate assistant for REU, there was a lull in having a DIMAC staff member officially working on REU. So I had a lot of support and some guidance, but a surprising amount of autonomy that I didn't realize wasn't the normal thing until retrospect. <laughs> so personally, I've really appreciated the people networks I've been part of as a result of the REU. As a start, the DIMAC staff are incredible, and you see the result of their work when you're at a workshop, but I had a core office in the hallway with all the staff for three summers, and of my three offices on campus, that was my favorite one to get work done, just because the DIMAC staff are so supportive, encouraging, just awesome humans. It allowed me to connect with some awesome faculty as well, like Nina. And it was really fun to help build that kind of network out of the undergraduates. So now, even 12 years since I've helped run the program, I can't go to, say, an AMS conference without running into a student. This happened even three weeks ago in Florida. And the connection is, oh, you were a student in the DIMAX REU while I was around. It even happened in Switzerland this summer. I ran into two of the Czech students from my summers at a conference in Zurich. So. The REU has really made an international network of cohorts starting very early in their career, and it was really fun to be part of that for three summers. Professionally, whether by design or accident, the amount of responsibility I had from helping review applications to planning the whole seminar series for the summer, to connecting with the industry partners to set up field trips, to helping students communicate their work, I think gave me a much bigger picture of what goes into running a successful program the way DIMAX does, and gave me credibility much earlier in my career to run my own REU program at Valparaiso. So I'm really thankful for that springboard so early in my career, considering that undergraduate research has been an important part of my whole professional trajectory. Thanks, Lara. Our last panel person is Martine Stanberry, and the first time I met her was at a reconnect. The program we run in the summer, usually one full week at various universities and colleges across the country, to introduce faculty who teach primarily at an undergraduate institutions, the current research that's going on on a particular topic. And as soon as I laid eyes on her, I said, okay, she's part of our DIMAX family and we'll find things for her to do. And we did. I mean, she became very much a part of Cicada, the Department of Homeland Security Center, including, as you will see in her bio, she won the award for diversity in, in the DHS context of Cicada. But I want her to tell you a little bit about how she fell into <laughs> Dimex <laughs> and what it's done for her. So in 2014, uh, we decided that we wanted to apply for 
a, a grant through the Department of Homeland Security, the Scientific Leadership Award for Minority Serving Institutions. So um, the proposal that we have focused on data analytics. So in order to actually submit the proposal, we needed one of the DHS Centers of Excellence to endorse our proposal. So we contacted um, Fred Roberts and he read it, I guess, and he sent, you know, a letter to say that, you know, they would be willing to partner with us if we received the funding. And so we did. And at that point, that's when um, I was came into the community of Dimax, but also Cicada. Um, and we were really welcomed uh, in every aspect. Uh, since that time, we've engaged with them in many different capacities uh, because of that partnership through the grant. But um, for myself, professionally, I actually started to participate in the retreat that they hosted in the spring, um, the research retreat, as well as the reconnect workshops. Uh, and I feel like it just broadened um, my professional network. Uh, it made me to think differently about teaching and how research can be connected to, you know, the classroom and what I'm doing there. And um, it also made me more inspired to maybe slightly change directions as far as the research that I actually conduct. You know, it made me believe that I didn't have to stay in the area that I was in, you know, from my dissertation, which is good. That really um, kind of opened me up to some other opportunities, uh, especially as I progressed as a faculty member. So uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I think uh, that this relationship will continue, and I agree with the other panelists that uh, you do feel inspired by the individuals you meet uh, that are a part of Cicada and Dimax because even though they're very mature, they're still very active, they want to <laughs> learn, and they're still willing to do a lot of work. So it's like, okay, I'm just at the early stages of my career, so I really need to be on top of my game. So uh, I like that too, just, just seeing that and those uh, examples and role models of how to be a faculty member and continue to be successful and productive. Thanks, Martine. The second question has been alluded to already, namely, what do you see as future opportunities for DIMAX in the educational framework of anything from pre-K to graduate school and beyond? Um, and I won't just go down the aisle anymore. You can raise your hand and agree to speak. <laughs> so, <laughs> Saul? <laughs> well, um, just a tiny bit of history. Um, some of you may know that uh, there's been a lot of work starting uh, really in 1989 um, on the, uh, the K-12 standards of what should be taught in mathematics, led by NCTM. And the NCTM standards came out in 89. It was quite a forward-looking document. Uh, discrete math was uh, prominent, <laughs> modeling was prominent, applications. Um, and in fact, NSF, uh, after that, uh, while Midge was uh, still there, um, funded a number of curriculum development projects um, at elementary, middle, and high school that um, tried to make the uh, work of the NCTM standards extent. And in fact, COMAP had one of the high school comprehensive curriculum projects. At any rate, the, uh, after those books and programs came out, the math wars began, and there was a lot of pushback against some of the types of use of technology, use of applications, so on and so forth, discrete mathematics. And um, then in 2000, when NCTM wrote a second version of the standards, the word discrete was used exactly three times in the document. Um, subsequent to that, um, you've got the Common Core State Standards in Mathematics, which has now been out for, I don't know, seven or eight years, um, no longer uh, in vogue, but nonetheless, if you looked at the 50 states who all have state standards by mandate, those state standards look very close to what the Common Core put out. The textbooks that are being used look very close to the topic areas in the Common Core, and they're terrible. 
Um, they're really a disaster. There's almost no discrete mathematics. Um, probability and statistics don't get mentioned, even flipping a coin until sixth or seventh grade. Um, algorithmic approach, statistic, discrete topics, 11th, 12th grade, maybe for STEM and STEM intending students. It's really awful. <laughs> and we, we can't let it stand. It's time to step up. No one's really happy. There's, in fact, some movement in National Academy, a conference board of the mathematical sciences, uh, the public, some of you may have read the publication 2025, to look at the high school curriculum in particular. But it's also clear the K-12 curriculum needs work. And what I hope to do in conversation today with people at DIMAX is look at this. Now, look what's actually happening. Yes, you've got the wars about continuous versus discrete mathematics. Kids are going to go into calculus. You've got topics in data analysis and statistics. You've got topics in computer science, which have uh, you know, looking at algorithms, looking at coding. It's a competition, and it's a Tower of Babel. It's time for that to stop. It's time for us to look at the K-12 curriculum as a curriculum in the mathematical sciences, not as my coding course is more important than your Algebra II course because you've got too many kids failing it. Enough already. So my argument is that we need to do a rethink. We need to go back to, the pol to having a political position, saying this is what needs to be done, and I think that COMAP, DIMAX, other organizations should bring together like-minded people to think about this in an intelligent and a comprehensive way. And that's what I think the next 30 years, or at least the next 10, should look like in terms of advocacy. Because otherwise, we're just remediating at uh, you know, 12th grade, at 13th grade, at 14th grade. It, it doesn't make any sense. And we're safe enough to do that now. Jim, you had indicated I'm taking questions people I, uh, well, we'll get questions after the we go this round I, I have to agree with Saul uh, we've come to a, a point in our education where we are measuring the wrong thing as a indicator of success we are testing standards and and teachers are teaching standards. They're not teaching math or students anymore. Um, as someone who struggles with this on a daily basis, we have now created teachers who are, have been in this system for so long that all they know is standards education. And it's not the standards that are the bad thing. It's the unintended consequences of the standardized testing. If the student teachers are being evaluated by this standardized testing and their administrators are being evaluated by this standardized testing, then that is what they are going to gear the education for, the testing and not the math. Um, this is something that I could go on about for hours and we don't have the time now and unfortunately some of you have you know, with a glass of wine had to listen to me somebody. about it. <laughs> and I, I thank you for that patience. But uh, we have, we've wrecked the system. And uh, Saul's right. We need to go back and, and look very carefully at, at what our real outcomes are and how we are going to measure those outcomes. Thanks, Jim. Christy, who, oh, she I needs. Okay, so I'm gonna approach this question from a slightly different perspective. So in educator preparation, we have like common threads through all of the education coursework for uh, what we'd call teacher candidates, pre-service teachers, depends on where you are in the country as to what you call them. Um, but we emphasize things like differentiation and assessment and cultural diversity and embedding those things into our lessons with our students. So my work with computational thinking right now and really kind of my next step, and I also kind of hope to develop this further in my state first and then kind of going nationally, is looking at embedding this idea of computational thinking across the curriculum, not just in math classes, not just in science classes, not just in secondary, but even in elementary education, right? So start 
getting students to do math and science in a way that is applicable and using an approach such as computational thinking to solve real world problems and deal with really large data sets. Um, because that's where our students are most concerned with. Um, earlier we were talking about kind of ecological sustainability and that's the age of students. They're having anxiety over this. I talk to pre-service teachers day in, day out who deal with anxiety and I'm like, well, what, what, what's really getting you? None of this matters. In 20 years, the world is going to be in such a state that it doesn't matter. So, okay, they're feeling helpless. Well, computational thinking is a way to help them deal with the real world that they're living in. And I think by reaching pre-service teachers, that can reach students and, and get to a much bigger audience and, and hopefully bring back kind of the the real world that our students are living in. I have a completely different direction to go as a faculty member at a primarily undergraduate institution where much of my life is working with undergraduate research. I think there is a whole sea of early and mid-career faculty who think undergraduate research would be a high impact process or practice but have no idea where to start and that's one of the things DIMAX already has a large group of people who have been doing this well for years. Simultaneously there's a lot of faculty who are kind of trained in their research silo and haven't been exposed to the breadth of interdisciplinary things going on that people who have been through DIMAX have. And I've seen programs or workshops that give people advice on how to get started with undergraduate research or totally different programs that expose people to a new research project, but I see almost nobody trying to do both at the same time, where you give faculty an idea of here are some interdisciplinary ideas, topics that are ripe for getting work done, and here's some advice on how to peel off pieces for undergraduates, and I think it takes a place like DIMAX that has the resources and the kind of interaction that happens here if that kind of program were to exist. Thanks, Laura. Martin or Martin, either of you? Uh, whatever, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Martin. Is, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, I'm, uh, I think uh, I'm conservative in this. I would say that you do things extremely well, uh, just continue doing it as you are doing. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's great, but uh, let's say in the second thought, I was thinking to mention this uh, internationalization, that uh, it's, uh, that's really an amazing fact, that uh, somehow I have little experience, but the experience which I have is that these uh, money providing agencies are extremely suspicious with any international uh, kind of element. So uh, it is, uh, so for instance, in this grant, uh, uh, the European grant, it's, I like it very much. It has, uh, it's really done for this international uh, collaboration, but we can, uh, the, the Europeans get the money. Right? And we can pay, we actually support, uh, also the, partly support the, the students, uh, the, the US students coming to Prague, uh, partly, and uh, we have some uh, uh, secondments of uh, students uh, from, uh, come from Princeton, uh, for instance, there were students in Prague which uh, we, uh, we pay, uh, but they, uh, they, it's us that we pay. Right. So it's uh, and uh, there is uh, I think that there is some implicit uh, uh, extreme suspicion in the air, which uh, on the European side uh, there uh, when there was this uh, panel on the future of centers it uh, it was this suspicion somehow was explicitly mentioned as well. So if there is a way somehow to uh, go against this uh, so these things would be great. Thank you. Martin, do you have comments about what you'd like to see us do? <laughs> so I, I think my response is different than the rest of the panelists, but um, from my perspective, I think that once faculty members have gone to like a reconnect or just on their own develop these course modules that maybe incorporate some research into their actual course delivery, that maybe we also need to think about what impacts that has on student outcomes. So are the students who are learning in this manner um, 
more persistent in STEM? Uh, are they more attracted to different types of career fields in STEM? Um, are they performing better? Or what, how, how does it impact the student? Uh, because sometimes I think that we come up with things and they seem great and maybe we spent a lot of time developing them. But if it's impacting students, I think at the end of the day, we have to figure out if it actually is a positive impact or it's just something nice that we're doing that we think is great, but it's not really impacting the student in the way in which it should um, if we're doing those things. So I think that would be an area to explore. And then how does it impact students in different courses, at different institutions, um, to actually see um, what benefit it is to, to do those types of things with your classes. And then also, I think that the different institutions could establish some outreach with like high school or K through 12 uh, and maybe have a day where they um, focus on data science or a particular topic or some kind of um, activity to kind of get the students engaged but also allow them to see other undergraduate students who are uh, involved because sometimes students need to see a younger face um, doing something to spark the interest or uh, the desire or the feeling that they can actually do it. So I think uh, that from the university perspective, maybe there's more that we can do to kind of start uh, those activities with engaging teachers and or their students uh, to really kind of um, improve what they were alluding to with how things are done now with the Common Core and what students see and know and how they're being trained. Thanks, Martine. I'll ask one question that is more appropriately answered by Jim and Christy. We have proved experimentally, I guess you'd have to say, to NSF and others that you can do professional development online in a quality way and that the teachers who have been in the groups that we've worked with are able to take what they learn into their own classrooms and teach effectively computational thinking in their own classrooms. And we've had teachers that aren't just math, science, computer science. We have French, Spanish, bit. And we have uh, had two third grade teachers. So when you talk about K or pre-K through grade 16 or whatever, this is an important uh, case study, if you wish. And my question is, particularly to those who are involved in undergraduate education, but with Christy and Jim commenting, is can we do online professional development in a number of different areas uh, for undergraduate faculty, in particular for community college faculty? We've develop some modules and sustainability for community college faculty. So we've got experience at every level at this point, but it clearly allows us to go to scale if we can do it online. I mean, we have people in Montana, Oklahoma City, who are now implementing the computational thinking um, materials and course and so forth. You wanna, either of you? <laughs> uh, the easy answer is yes. Uh, we, uh, there have been a lot of surprising results for our, from our uh, PD for CT uh, online courses, um, one of which Midge alluded to, that it wasn't just STEM people, and in fact I think our, our strongest influence has been on non-STEM teachers. And I think that that's where we have our greatest potential for change. Telling math and science people that math and science matters is really not making much of a change, but telling non-STEM people that math and science matters and convincing them is making a change. I think the uh, Math for Planet Earth uh, things that we worked on with Jean at Muhlenberg, I think that would be prime uh, place to start for this uh, online PD for community college teachers, especially. 
Uh, I think that we have a model in place. It will need some work. It will need some tweaking to uh, to hit the audience that we're looking for. But I think we have the. I think we have a good start for it, and I think it will. It will be. I think it's workable. I'm going to agree with Jim. Yes, this can be done. Uh, we we've proved that it it can be. And so when we're looking at going outside of what we're doing right now at a community college or even we've talked about uh, middle school, elementary school, the online professional development can be very, very rich. And the way that we have set up the modules are highly engaging for our teachers. We're not just asking them, hey, do the science, do the math. We're also asking them, how do you see this fitting in to your current curriculum? How will you use this? And those ideas have been so inspiring. And to see an actual learning community develop in an online platform, that's unique and that is rich. Part of that, I think, is we do have a face-to-face -face workshop with these teachers prior to the online uh, portion of the, the modules. So I think that person of person, you start building trust and then you continue that trust with your online presence. So yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think we've got a good start. I do think anytime we, we scale up, you've got to think about contextual fact factors. Who exactly is your audience? How has your audience changed? What do you need to change in terms of modules and dissemination of those modules? Um, but yeah, I definitely think we can do this and be successful. How about our uh, undergraduate people? <laughs> Laura and Martine. Do you see faculty at undergraduate institutions being willing to take an online professional development course? That's a basic question, I guess. Yes. Yes. I agree. <laughs> the basic answer. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we're always looking for professional development opportunities. Oh. So um, I think depending on what course was offered, you know, and, and how, how the course was actually set up, as far as you know how often you need to be engaging and all of that uh, I think it definitely would be something that a lot of faculty would be willing to take take advantage of mm -hmm. Laura same I agree <laughs> <laughs> yes twice <laughs> what I would like to do now because we are um, converging on a time frame when the congressman will be here is open this to questions that you have <laughs> It'd be interesting to see who he goes first to. <laughs> I guess I, I got the first one. Uh, you are a STEM group, and, and I've heard you talking about how exciting the response of educators is to the materials that you provide. But I really think Martine is asking the right question. Are you being able to track the positive impact on the students of those teachers? That's one question. And I'll sneak in another question. Uh, the national rankings show that there are other countries that seem to do a better job in teaching mathematics. Are those people measuring the wrong things or should we be taking a look at how those other countries are teaching mathematics? Let me answer your first question and I'll turn it around to the others who can answer the second one. We have a very strong research component to our professional development online program. Suzanne Wilson had hoped to be here, and I don't think she's here this morning. Um, there's health issues in her family, but Suzanne is chaired the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Science Professional Development, where there was a huge chapter on online professional development in science. And so she has a rigorous research program to test whether the students, as well as the teachers, have learned techniques of computational thinking but are, are beginning to think differently. And she's begun with the first group of teachers that we've had in Missouri, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania. So we should have some interesting results by the end of this year of school. Now, the second question, <laughs> I will turn over to Saul. <laughs> yeah, um, just serendipitously, the 2018 PISA results will be out on December 3rd, 
and you can, on December 4th, pick up your newspaper and find out how terrible we've done <laughs> and how we should put more money in and, what oh, God, what's happening to us. Um, <laughs> you know, Slovenia did bet, you know, whatever. You, you've seen those headlines. Um, I can't speak for some of the other international comparisons like Tim's, which is more of a, a classical uh, curriculum uh, type of a test. But PISA is supposed to be is a test of cohorts of 15-year-olds, and it's supposed to be a test on how they can use mathematics in the world. So can you read a bus schedule? Can you figure out a payment plan for your phone versus, uh, you know, if to, et cetera? Um, so it's sort of designed as a more of a modeling exam. It, uh, I was intimately involved with the 2012 uh, exams on the math expert group for the prepared the 2012 questions. In 2012, which was, by the way, the last year that math was the major subject, it'll be again in 2021, but it's tested every three years. Um, what, what, what we found, which was really interesting because it goes counter to the sort of typical uh, criticism one gets, we found that American teams did better than the world average on routine single computations. So they were fine. Uh, everybody says, oh, we can't add, we can't subtract, we don't know our multiplication tables, you know, we're not quick enough. That isn't true. Uh, what is true is any time we're asked to think, we did much worse than the rest of the world. Uh, and, well, I mean, I could phrase that in more educational ease, but basically that's, and I suspect that's what's going to happen again. Um, are we asking the wrong questions? I mean, you know, I go back to what Jim said. Uh, I have a Dan there's a Danish project, uh, proverb which says, uh, a sheep doesn't gain weight if you weigh it more often. <laughs> and um, we test at third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and once in high school uh, on the, the common core or at some you know, standard, standard testing. Doesn't seem to help very much. But that's the status as far as I know it. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses out there. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. David? Um, yeah, the, the argument to change the curriculum, it, it definitely resonates with me. You know, my kids are in school, and they're basically taking the same math that I took. Um, so I, and I think a lot of people in this room, it, would res it does resonate with. But, and you, you phrase it like we should take a political stance. I just wonder if, like, is there a way to to prove this more like a scientific argument, like uh, data-driven, maybe there's already data out there that, yeah, because it re the idea resonates with me, but can you show that this is really true? A broad education is better than deep, because calculus is a good thing to learn too. I, there's nothing bad about that, but no, you know, I, what, I what can you say about, um, you know, the data behind this change? I can't, but maybe someone can. Um, and what Saul said is indicative of standardized testing. We test a standard. We train our students to do problems that require one step of thinking. We are good at one step of thinking. My students that are coming into my uh, discrete math class, my senior level discrete math class, are good at one step of thinking. But when I, when I try to get them to do problems that require multiple steps and when they, when they are required to pick from a set of tools rather than me telling them which tool to use. That's where, that's where our students are, are hampered by their education. Uh, it's not that we aren't getting that fundamental basic education in math. I, I'm thinking that we can do better. There are examples, uh, David, of other countries that have invested their time and energy into this. I mean, in 2003, the PISA results came out and there was what, in Germany, it was a disaster because they were only slightly better than us. Um, and that was made headlines. It, it, they made head, it really, it did. And they had uh, literally a nine-year program to go from 2003 to 2012 where they changed the national standards, they changed statewide standards, where they did a massive um, professional development program and 
they're, they've increased dramatically. So, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, it's, it's always very tricky when people say, say to you, prove it. You know, prove that your new curriculum, which you haven't written yet, is going to be better <laughs> in some right, quantifier. It's going to be better than the existing curriculum. And then the parent comes to you and says, now, are you experimenting on my child? <laughs> um, that's why it's political. That's yeah. why when you change curricula, it is political by, by its nature. I'm not saying you have to go and, you know, we have a banner, but there's the nature of the, of the change is political. But there is de adequate proof that other countries have done this and are doing better. But I also think that right now, this business about the the, uh, the mix between mathematics, algorithmic coding, discrete mathematics, um, statistical data analysis, and I didn't even mention financial literacy, which is a big thing since the 2008, where people want to teach good financial uh, practices to kids. It doesn't exist. It really doesn't, I think, exist anywhere in the world that where it's been done from scratch in some nice, seamless way. I think it's a problem worth working on. Maybe it's just worth talking about putting out some interesting papers on it or some proceedings of a conference, but it's certainly worth thinking about. Uh, and, and now is an excellent time. Yeah, I'll make one comment that hasn't come up in the most recent discussion of, of mathematics, particularly in high school, but as an impartial observer, I'll say. <laughs> Once we went to suggesting calculus should be taken by all students and that that is the only way to get into universities and colleges is to have calculus on your transcript. Whether or not you take the AP exam, having it on your transcript makes a difference. What that caused to happen in the curriculum in high schools in order to fit calculus in, it pushed algebra one to eighth grade. And virtually every school in the country teaches most of their students, if not all, algebra one and eighth grade. And as a consequence, the whole sequencing of mathematics instruction has changed rather dramatically over time. And so what happens to the student who in eighth grade really doesn't know enough algebra to move into geometry or algebra two, they're pushed ahead and into those classes. We're beginning to see some of the same kinds of phenomena with the computer science AP exams where they don't necessarily get exempted from taking the CS principles course. They don't necessarily know how to interact with students in the same class that have had no computer science whatsoever. So you put a person who got a four on an AP computer science exam with a person who's had no background in computer science, the person with no background is going to feel outclassed a bit because of the knowledge base. One horrible statistic, 250,000 people yearly who take the calculus AP exam and get anywhere from a three to a five are put in pre-calculus when they get to college. It's taken me a while to figure out why. And s most of it is blamed on the AccuPlacer and the insistence on taking the AccuPlacer at big universities like Rutgers <laughs> in both English and math and the per whether you've passed the AP exams, whether you've taken calculus in high school, you still have to take the AccuPlacer and they find you can't factor quadratics and cubics quick enough, down goes your score. So there's all kinds of th things in, that are being iterated <laughs> in education, particularly in math education, which I know probably better than science education, which is why I have people like Christy here. But I think we need to look at the big picture and look at what is going to be part of the big picture going forward. And the only reason I know the calculus stuff is I was asked by Lou Gross and Raina Robova to, with Fred, although it's, I've done it now so far, <laughs> 
to write a perspective piece effectively on calculus since his 1982 article on calculus. <laughs> and in the process, I've found out these statistics like the 250,000. If I were a parent, I'd be freaked out to think my student got a four in AP calculus and now they have to take pre-calculus. What happens next? Um, Rebecca. Can can I just comment on that? Um, Lou Gross, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so first of all, I, I, I face this same issue with students and the universities who are going to be effective will empower the students to make their own decisions about what's appropriate for them and not base it on some awful placement exactly. test. And yes, there will be failures, but students learn from failures. Uh, and, and so that's, that's my response to that. I've tried at my institution. Um, I have a question that, uh, to, to the panel in helping David move forward with <laughs> DIMAX, okay? Uh, and DIMAX has been phenomenally successful at fostering the connections between disciplines. Mm -hmm. My question to you all is, should DIMAX, through a set of programs of various kinds, encourage this more than it has been at both K through 12 and uh, in, in college. And you mentioned online uh, uh, methods. So there are methods that have been effective at, in this case, crossing biology and mathematics, faculty mentoring networks that have been developed by an NSF project, CubeSub. Um, and so my question to you is providing uh, some advice to David and the rest of the crew moving forward about this multidisciplinary connection and what can be done in both K through 12 and undergraduate education. Perhaps that DIMAX can help foster. Who would like to take that one on? Uh, Joe's standing up. Are you going to answer his question? No, I, I, I have the next question. Oh. <laughs> okay. So we need an answer to this question. So I was already standing. Yes. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we've, we've worked on these and, and we're hoping to continue working on them. And David's going to be the one and rest of the people at DIMAX are going to be the one to decide what direction we're going in. Um, I can't wait to see what happens. And what grants we apply for. <laughs> right. uh, yes, yes. Uh, this hits a nerve with me considering that the Conference Board of, of Mathematical Sciences now is looking at the gaps between uh, K-12 math and higher ed math and I think DIMAX could definitely plug into that. Uh, there are 23 states that are looking at this now. And I looked at the list of states and I didn't see New Jersey as one of the participating states. But um, they are looking at the disconnect, just as Midge mis uh, mentioned that you could have students who do um, take calculus in high school and, and pass the AP, AP test. And one of the reasons they don't do well is they may have taken that that calculus early in, in their uh, high school years, but yet when they get to Rutgers or wherever, they're tested on algebra concepts that they may have forgotten in terms of uh, manipulation and some of the trig identities, and there you go, they're in pre-calculus. Yeah. Okay, may I, uh, is it my turn now? Joe, did you have an answer to his question? <laughs> In part. Okay, okay. Well, I, I wanted uh, to make some comments on what different people said, but let me start with the question of uh, taking calculus in high school. I and some others did a study uh, which uh, showed that of the students who come to Rutgers who have taken calculus in high school, fewer than one sixteenth of the six percent of the students benefited from taking calculus in high school. So let me tell you why it's 1 16th. Of those who took uh, calculus in high school, half took AP calculus. Of those who took AP calculus, half took the exam. Of those who took the exam, half got four or five, giving them uh, 
access to uh, advanced placement, and of those who got four or five, only half took advantage of advanced placement. So in other words, we are distorting, our, we have been distorting uh, our high school curriculum uh, for the benefit of maybe 6% of the students who take calculus who really get advanced placement. What many, many students do is use calculus in high school to avoid taking calculus in college. Okay, so that's the basic thing we have to understand. The second major thing is what something that um, um, Midge alluded to. Uh, as a result, students are taking Algebra 1 in 8th grade and 7th grade, and many, many middle school teachers are not qualified to teach Algebra 1 uh, so in the 7th or 8th grade. So people are getting a worse education from that. I also wanted to comment on international comparisons. Uh, they're all flawed. We shouldn't believe a word of what's, uh, what's said. Uh, for example, with PISA, uh, they uh, evaluate students who are 15 years old in different countries. I learned uh, in, after when the Hungarian failed revolution came and uh, in the 1950s and students came to my high school from Hungary, uh, I learned that what they, they were all two years ahead. And then the question was, is that bad or good? Well, we let our kids play when they're younger. We let them develop. Instead of pushing more and more math onto them, pushing more and more knowledge onto them, which is not necessarily a good idea. Our people do, do generally pretty well with our educational system, uh, so we can't make that comparison. Uh, we also can't make the comparison, you know, like one country did much better than another country, because very often the average number of questions answered correctly between country A, which did went up well up here, and country B, which is over here, could have been just one question more that students answered correctly. So it's not a major difference. Uh, we also have to be aware that in many countries uh, uh, there's almost like compulsory after-school education in mathematics. Uh, we also have to be aware that in countries like Singapore, um, the, uh, the, the, the students who are measured are only those who are uh, in the wealthier community because all the people who are poorer in Singapore uh, don't live in Singapore. They live in wherever it is, the country that's next door, <laughs> Malaysia. Right, so, so there, there are many reasons why the international comparisons are faulty. Um, I, I, uh, I, I wanted just to pick up on what, uh, um, uh, just to mention what I said last night, so that Saul, you'll recognize the same thing, that after talking with Joe Malkovich, I also suggested that DIMAX, uh, at this point, uh, I didn't call it political, but I thought it would be a good idea for us to gather a group together to figure out how we can respond to the current situation, and I strongly endorse what you say about that. Christy, do you want to No question. Sure. I do. All right, so I'm going to try to keep this quick, but I want to address your question about this gap between high school and higher education. Uh, we're not doing a very good job teaching our students to think in high school. And there's some pretty decent reasons from a teacher perspective as to why we're not doing that. In mathematics specifically, there's over 133 standards that you have to teach, and those are not requiring students to think. All right, you have a little over 200 days to make sure that you're teaching all of those standards, and those standards are gonna vary from state to state. So that's a big part of it, and when students are entering college, as undergraduate faculty members, we have this idea that those students kind of know how to think, but they don't, right? So there's that gap. And I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do with this computational thinking online professional development is really trying to get at how you can incorporate those bazillion standards you have to teach in very rich modules that get your students to think and to think about the math that they are doing and in the context that they're doing it in. So I, I think we're making strides at trying to address that gap. But there's something systemically very, 
I'll just go ahead and say it wrong with our education system today. I'll stick my neck out there. There was a time when teachers were trusted that they knew their subject matter and they could teach. They could teach the way their class led them to teach. They were free to go off on tangents and to incorporate discrete mathematics, to do a lot of unique and creative things. And then came the world of standardized testing and assessment, right? And that really squashes teacher creativity. Uh, my mom, who was a, a lifelong educator, she always said, if they just let me teach the things I could do, the things my students could do, if they would just let me teach. And so I, I feel like that, that freedom needs to be addressed systemically in our K through 12. Let's thank the panel.